Ustras Bryce in Nevada that it would cause the hydrogen in the, and oxygen in the atmosphere to join the chain reaction and the Earth would be consumed by fire in a matter of seconds, the entire Earth. Uh, they were sure that wouldn't happen. And when we tested the device uh, in uh, July 1945, it didn't happen. So uh, then they had this, they had these two bomb designs uh, working the assumption that one of them might not work. Actually, both of these devices did work. And the first one uh, was dropped on Hiroshima, the city of Hiroshima. Uh, here you see the before and after, the top and the bottom of the city of Hiroshima as a result of the explosion of one atomic bomb. Now, um, the atomic bomb was a, 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 a of mass destruction. It was it would be illegal under current uh, legal structures. But uh, anyway, at the war, the, the design was devastating bombs. Actually, before the atomic bomb was detonated over Hiroshima, we had destroyed the cities of Dresden, Germany, and uh, uh, several other German cities by creating what was called a firestorm. And these firestorms were actually uh, the other, another one that's uh, very important was Tokyo. These firestorms killed over 100,000 people. And uh, what, it, uh, what it marks is that in the period from the First World War, which was a war between armies, and the Second World War, we shifted to a war on populations. So the atomic bomb was a, a war of mass destruction and a, a killing device. Uh, the president at the time, President Truman, said that uh, there was no decision to make as to whether to use the bomb. The bomb was going to be used as soon as it was ready, and it was. We had uh, second thoughts about that simply because the projections that we see were that the United States would suffer up 500,000 to 1 million total in the attempts to take the islands of Japan, and that the Japanese would not surrender until they saw the devastating power of these bombs. After the war, the bombs were considered multiple devices. And they were not yet something sort of in a separate category that only the president would control. So you see here that the uh, actions where soldiers were sent into the bombed area uh, immediately after the detonation, as if they would attack now, there would be a destruction of some military target, and then they would charge forward uh, as a former infantryman, I can't imagine. But um, uh, they even developed an artillery device that would fire artillery projectiles uh, across the battlefield like you're seeing today in Ukraine. And these these uh, to be impractical because as a result of attacking uh, the two Japanese cities, we discovered something called radiation. The effects of the radiation were far more dangerous and devastating than we had anticipated. Now, there was a scientist involved in the movie and in the, in the uh, project. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Andrew Teller, T E L L E R. He's the father of the H bomb, the hydrogen bomb. When he saw the development of the A bomb, the atomic bomb, he said, well, uh, I can see how we could make this much more powerful. The result was uh, the each bomb, and actually we do not use or deploy any atomic bombs anymore at all. All of our bombs are now hydrogen bombs, which is at least 10,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. They make a big Splash if you uh, drop them in the way. These, these were tests that were conducted in the Pacific, and the fallout from these tests uh, irradiated a number of islands and killed a lot of people and quite a few uh, fishermen who happened to be uh, closer than they should have been had we known how big these explosions were actually going to turn out to be. 
The two largest bombs ever uh, exploded were the United States Castle Bravo bomb, which equated to 15 million tons of TNT. Uh, that's an unimaginable mountain of TNT, but it was nothing compared to what the Russians came up with, which was Chalamba, which uh, was on this bomb, and that was 58 million tons of TNT, and that was down, that was suppressed from the 100 million tons of TNT that uh, they could have exploded. What they were saying to the United States was, if you have a big H-bomb, we can make a bigger one. And in fact, there's no limit to how large these H-bombs and how powerful they could be. Now, then, uh, you hear a lot of people about how many nuclear weapons are and who's ahead. Uh, the United States and Russia have roughly the same number of uh, bombs, and I can get to the details if anybody is interested. Uh, but uh, really, the, the puzzling part of this is, let's say we have 11,000 nuclear warheads that it could be deployed or used right now. And in fact, we do. We and the Russians have that many warheads. If we detonated them all, we would do something called omnicide, omnicide, which is the elimination of all life on Earth. Why? Because once you detonate that many huge bombs, you will put soot and debris into the stratosphere, up above the upper atmosphere. It will circle the Earth, and by the end of the first year, the temperature of the Earth will drop to below freezing. So there will be no crops. So even if you're living safely in Australia and New Zealand, let's say, uh, maybe not Australia, since they are they now a close ally. But uh, if you're moving somewhere, maybe Iceland, uh, you won't necessarily be affected immediately. But over the period of the year, everybody will die. It's called on the side. Uh, this is a breakdown, and, and to dispel any uh, rumors, lies, propaganda, the United States and Russia have roughly the same number of nuclear warheads deployed that is actually available to be triggered and used today, right now. I had a student who was a missile wing commander. She had 10 nuclear armed missiles under her command. And they practiced uh, the, the procedure, which would be they would get a code from the White House to the Department of Defense, to this missile silo complex in North Dakota. And uh, she would turn one key, as you see in the movies, and somebody far away across the room would turn the other key. They had to turn it within a half a second of each other. If they did, the, the missiles that they controlled would launch. Now, they tested these people by detaching their missiles without telling them from the launch system and then having them go through the procedure all the way to turning the keys. And if they didn't turn the key, they would be fired from the military, from the Air Force. If they did turn the key, they, were, they would get a, a pat on the back. Good job. Now, we also have the missiles, uh, I'm sorry, we have bombs deployed in Europe and in NATO. Of course. Next year, so you see here the Princess uh, uh, Caprina Amalia uh, visiting the base, and just to her uh, left, that's an underground storage area where they are about to bring in nuclear warheads. And uh, I don't know if they told you about it, but uh, she's not a pilot, but she was dressed like one. And that's a, an airplane that they would use to drop those bombs. So the reason why we have those bombs in Europe is because we want to convince our NATO allies that if they are attacked with nuclear weapons, we will counterattack with nuclear weapons. Now, what is underlying this whole setup of, of all these thousands of warheads in both sides? And I, they, I'm not going to focus on China, but the Chinese have 300 nuclear warheads as well. Uh, 
And, and by the way, the Jews only enter into an uncontrolled agreement when we have 1,550 deployed, and we want them to reduce their, their uh, supply of 300. Um, but the United States and Russia are pretty much equal, let's say. But you see, uh, the deterrence has a concept behind it, which is that you're just trying to prevent the other side from using their weapons. You're trying, it's a mental game, right? You're trying to convince them that there's no point in using their weapons. But because you have all those weapons and all those experts and all those military people and all those people at the Pentagon and the State Department and everyone else working on this stuff, it eventually evolves into a nuclear war fighting process. And uh, as someone who worked on the warheads um, at one point in my life, the targeting people at the Pentagon could never fail to come up with more targets. So you have more warheads, we have more targets. In fact, you still don't have enough warheads. And that's how uh, uh, this thing uh, got pretty much out of control in the 60s. Deterrence requires three things, capabilities, intent to use those capabilities, and an assumption of rationality on both sides. Think uh, Kim Jong-un, okay? Um, I don't know, I don't know. An adequate deterrent must convince our any adversary, rather, no matter how skillful or ingenious their attack might be, that they will that it will result in a large scale destruction of their society and their military forces. But here's an interesting dilemma. This is deterrence, right? We have all these huge numbers of weapons and carry things to carry the weapons, but would we use those weapons? So here's a dilemma that you could ask yourself: if the US were attacked out of the blue right now, and 50 million Americans died. From the attack, that's the estimate of the Pentagon. Um, why would we retaliate? Because that would cause homicide. That would kill all of us as well. So we would kill 50 million Russians because they killed 50 million Americans. And uh, the guy who made that decision was Putin. So maybe we should just drop one on the, on the Kremlin or wherever the heck it might be. Maybe we drop a number of them on Moscow. But does it make sense? Does any of this make sense? Is the rationality question uh, relevant in this whole equation? Now, uh, a principle that evolved in the 60s and later it kept growing uh, to the peak of uh, the nuclear armaments of the United States and the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union and the U.S. had over 60,000 operational nuclear warheads, and then a series of arms control agreements were reached, and you see them referred to. Uh, it's sad to say that uh, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces of Treaty is, is, has been dropped by both the United States and Russia. Start one, which uh, I and Karen worked on, uh, did begin a downward trend that was followed to by Start two, by Sort, and by the New Start Agreement, which has been happily, I'm happy to say, re revisited and reaffirmed for three more years. Three more years. Uh, the question is. Um, you know, where are all those other words? Well, they're only waiting destruction. And that's a high risk profession if you want a job right now, uh, or you have young, some young people who are looking for work. Uh, uh, dismantling nuclear warheads is probably a growth industry. The United States has where we, a concept which we developed back in the 1950s called the triad land, sea, and air. This is all from the uh, 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 Pentagon website, by the way. And so we have uh, young people who operate the missile silos and are there, like the ones I, the one I mentioned, to turn the keys. And we, they are armed with 400 minimum missiles that are in silos, in concrete silos uh, spread across the northern uh, tier of the United States, or four states. Of course, 
you got to modernize, right? So uh, back in the time of President Obama, he was confronted by a proposal from the Pentagon to modernize our entire nuclear force structure. One of the things that we're running into trouble in the Congress, and the Congress loves nuclear weapons because every state in the union has some hand in the pot of money that goes with modernization of nuclear weapons. So uh, Obama decided not to fight it. And so he approved a $1 trillion modernization effort over the next 20 years, beginning at the end of his administration. So now we're six years beyond that. The price has risen, surprise, surprise, to $1 trillion. Uh, dollars. And the, a piece of it is this uh, Sentinel ICBM, which will be new, faster, bigger, more powerful, more accurate. And of course, it will need new silos. And the silos have to be more survivable, quote unquote. And they have to have new wheelheads because it's a new missile. So everything about this, the land based systems will be rebuilt. And we will not, we will do it simultaneously with keeping existing Yemen missiles in their silos. And then one by one, we will switch them out as uh, the, each one is, is rebuilt. This is a self looking ice cream cone. Um, now, I have, a, I have a thing about land based missiles. If you have a GPS, who doesn't have a GPS, right? Uh, in their phone, in their car. Uh, you know where you are within meters, and you, you're not even using the one that the military uses. They're much more accurate. So it's a given that a silo, a, a, a fixed tube of concrete in the ground, is of no location that the Russians, the Chinese, and a half of other countries know where it is. Now, the way that the Pentagon explains why we still have them is because they are what they call a red sponge, that the, in order to be sure you destroy each of the 400 silos, you need to fire 800 warheads at them. So you see how this targeting thing works in people's minds. It's, it's all crazy, but there it is. That's the land-based element. We have ballistic missile submarines, which are the most secure and, and stealthiest uh, part of our arsenal. We have 14 now, and but of course, they're all going to be replaced. So we're going to replace them with uh, the 14 with 12 Columbia class submarines, which of course have to have new missiles and new warheads. I love this uh, bottom slide from General Dynamics, so I had to uh, bring it up a bit uh, because uh, what you see in here is that this submarine will be entirely new. Everything about this submarine is new. The way it propels itself, the nuclear reactors, the missiles themselves, how the missiles are mounted in the submarine. 70% uh, of our operational missiles will be on submarines and are right now. But I think somebody who made this slide had a sense of humor because you'll be happy to hear that the entire submarine is recyclable. All right, then we have the airplanes. Now, uh, you, now uh, the, the, the good thing about the airplanes is if you launch them from their bases, they can be recalled. What I, uh, what I didn't mention about the land-based missiles is once they leave the silo, they cannot be recalled. They will go to their target and detonate. Well, we have uh, two, uh, we have uh, the B-52s, which are 70 years old. And we have the B-2s, which are so ineffective and so difficult to maintain that we finally decided we're only going to build uh, a small number of them, and then we're going to replace them with a new stealth bomber, which is called the B-21 Raider. It will be uh, not faster, but it will be more stealthy, it will be more difficult to detect. Uh, it will carry fewer bombs than the, the, the B-2, but um, it's new and uh, North, uh, Northrop Grumman loves it. 
Now there are also new capabilities that are, are, are that should be of concern. And I have been in a correspondence with uh, Representative Bergman about uh, one of these, which I'll come to. But cyber attack, obviously a concern. Space-based interceptors, which do not exist right now, but which, which could knock out satellites. High energy lasers, which could be used as weapons. Autonomous weapons, which could be grouped with a, a single weapon, let's say one bomber with 20 sub bombers, 20 drones, if you will, that would fly with the bomber. So you have more targets for the enemy to take care of. Uh, adaptive camouflage, that ship has an adaptive camouflage that makes it disappear to normal radar. And most important of all, artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence, uh, I'll come to a, 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 an action you can take on this at the end. Artificial intelligence is a factor in uh, the man who saved the world. A, a Russian colonel named Stanislav Petrov was sitting at his uh, command center and uh, the system told him that the United States had launched its land-based missiles towards Russia. There's a movie, this is on the on the Netflix, I think. And uh, he was supposed to call the, the Kremlin and then launch his missiles. He didn't, he refused. He, he did not make that decision. He said to his staff, I want to see the first mushroom cloud in Russia before I touch the, before I launch these missiles. Uh, obviously there was none, it was a mistake. The computer had decided that the missiles had been from the United States had been launched. They were wrong. This is, this is a, a factor when we think about using computers in any case. Uh, and you can uh, read, there are two good books on this. One is Command and Control. Uh, which talks about a nuclear accident in Arkansas that might have killed the future president of the United States, Bill Clinton, and the dead hand. This, the Russians were so worried that we would figure out a way to prevent them from launching their nuclear missiles that they created a new weapon. Uh, and this is uh, a weapon that's referred to in the movie Dr. Strangelove, but it actually exists. And this system is designed that if there are nuclear detonations on the territory of Russia, the dead hand will automatically launch their land-based missiles at the United States, automatically. And this is the assumption that there is nobody in control in Moscow. So they will automatically retaliate, quote unquote. Now there are new nuclear capable weapons that are coming down the pike from the United States, from uh, Russia and from China. Uh, these have uh, the advantage of being extremely fast. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is the decision process. How does the decision get made? The, the, a, the, an attack is detected. It is reported to the Pentagon. It is, uh, there's a, an officer who goes with the president everywhere. Uh, he's carrying what he calls the football. And he's got the, quote, the launch codes in that briefcase. And the launch codes are, are approved by the president to retaliate. And then the launch warning, the launch warning and the launch command, it goes to our nuclear forces and we attack or we counterattack. Now you may feel that, well, we've only used these weapons twice. Uh, I wish that were true, but it's not. We use nuclear weapons to threaten each other. What has Putin done with nuclear weapons in Ukraine? We've done it several times. We did it in a Suez crisis. Uh, President Nixon had uh, his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, tell the Russians that the president, he, Nixon, was a bit crazy and that he had already ordered that there would be a nuclear attack on North Vietnam. This is the use of nuclear weapons. It's just that we didn't actually drop the bombs. So there, the, the nuclear weapons have played a role in, on the political side of the uh, discussion. Now, risk reduction, I'm, this is probably my proudest moment. 
uh, I was asked to write a, an agreement uh, that would uh, reduce the risk of nuclear war. That sounds easy. Um, <laughs> but a couple of things that happened, the uh, Soviets had tested a nuclear uh, armed missile with dud warheads, not real warheads, and four warheads had landed on the four corners of the island of Hawaii. We were not amused. And then, and we complained and they said, oh yeah, well, listen, what we saw. And they showed us a photograph of four American missile silos with their lids open. This 60 ton block of concrete was where all four of them were open. It was a maintenance work mistake. So the, the, the threat, caused the Russians, to, the Soviets at that time, to raise their threat level. So these two incidents led to an agreement. Uh, it was a very simple agreement at, at first, uh, but it was signed at the, the Rose Garden, and then a, a very young-looking Jack Siegel uh, got the privilege of handing it to the Secretary of State. And I visited the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center 30 years later, and it's still in operation. And now I go to two acts of Congress that are currently under consideration. They are both, both of these acts of Congress are uh, have bilateral uh, Republican and Democrat uh, sponsors. Uh, I'm gonna drop the, the second one because I don't think it'll ever happen. Uh, I can explain why later, but block nuclear launch by Autonomous Artificial Intelligence Act of 2023. This, this legislation says that at no case will the United States ever rely on artificial intelligence to determine whether to use our nuclear weapons. That we will always require an, a human in the process to make that decision. So uh, uh, I can give you more on that. I even have a draft letter if you give me your your uh, email, I'll send you the draft letter you can send to your representatives. There are lots of movies and it's a little surprising to see that uh, most of the young people have never seen any of these movies. Uh, but the day after was at one, at one point, 100 million people watched it, it was a television show. It's very scary. Um, and uh, all of them have a basis in reality, in, in the, the situation that we have created for ourselves. That's all I wanna lecture you on, and now I welcome your questions. Okay. Thank you. You have Tom and, uh, go ahead. Oh, we, we're going to need a microphone. I'm sorry, because we have we're on Zoom. I'll ask you to start again. I've heard that is this it's it's there. Can you hear me? Okay, I've heard that the most likely scenario for an exchange of nuclear weapons it sounds like a some sort of a car club or something, but uh, is between India and Pakistan because of the constant. Uh, provocations on both sides. And then of course, people speculate on Iran attacking Israel. Uh, of all of the scenarios, which is most likely to result in a nuclear exchange? Um, well, it, could it be uh, Iran against, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, India against Pakistan? Yes, it's quite possible. Both countries have missiles and they have warheads for the missiles and uh they could get into a nuclear battle that's true uh they don't have such a large number of warheads so it might uh you know uh humans might intervene and decide this is crazy we have to stop theoretically uh herman khan did a lot of study of game theory in around 1960 and he wrote a book with the catchy title on thermonuclear war uh, he has what he called a, an escalation ladder. And so what happens as a, a non-nuclear fight, like let's say Russia against Ukraine, uh, leads to a nuclear element to that fight, which leads to a threat, which leads to an actual detonation 
Now, once you start detonating nuclear warheads, nobody knows how to stop. If you detonate one nuclear warhead, let's say in Guam, let's say Kim Jong-un does it from North Korea, we would retaliate with one or two, more likely. And then that adversary would retaliate with more. And we would have to go with more and back and forth and very quickly, maybe in a matter of an hour or two, this would be completely out of control and we would be firing all of our missiles and launching all of our bombers and firing missiles from submarines. It, it, the most dangerous situation uh, to my personal view is North Korea because North Korea is, he doesn't fit that rationality uh, category. Uh, he, he could, uh, feel that he is under threat of extinction, that we're going to destroy his regime and decide to attack South Korea, or he has now the capability to attack Seattle. Now, let's say he does attack Seattle. Well, no, let's say he threatens to attack Seattle and he actually fires up a missile and has it sitting on the pad. Are we going to trade Seattle for? deterring him from taking soul. These, these calculations need to be understood and made because they will not have much time to make them. I refer to the, the process of the president making a decision. That decision process for land-based missiles is 30 minutes, but actually that would mean that it would take 30 minutes for a missile from Russia to reach where we would detect it on our radars. At that point, the president would be told there's an attack on underway, it's coming. We do not subscribe to the no first use concept. The United States has always had a first use concept as underlying our nuclear forces. If we think an attack is underway, we have allowed ourselves to launch our counterattack before that first mushroom cloud appears on American territory. And no president has ever entertained the idea of no first use. That's why I dropped it from the list of, of two acts in Congress right now. So it's a matter of uh, uh, the most, who's the most dangerous actor in all of this. You could say Putin is in that, almost that same category of Kim Jong-un, uh, but Russia has uh, three, it requires three decisions, the president, the secretary of defense, and the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, their equivalent. We only require the president. So there's one hand on the button in the United States. There are three in Russia, and they might uh, be a little more cautious than, than we would be. Very good question. Thank you. One of your three, um, hold it real close to your mouth. Yeah. One of the three things you mentioned is is rationality, and a couple of years ago, um, President Trump, in competition, I guess, with uh, North Korea, there was a distinct lack of rationality on both sides. Should there be an emphasis on rationality in those seeking higher office? That the presidency is probably the highest office. Should there be a test to guarantee that whoever takes office is rational enough to engage in this sort of contest, if you like? Well, I certainly feel that rationality should be a test that we apply to all of our leaders. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I worked at the State Department for many years. I'm not going to take sides in that debate, but uh, uh, the President Trump has repeatedly, he repeatedly said, that uh, nuclear, that's a real bad thing. Um, and uh, that's a good quote. Um, and uh, but he has, he's, he's been being expressed repeatedly during the campaign uh, against uh, now President Biden. Uh, he would take nuclear weapons off the table. And he said, I'm a negotiator. I don't take anything off the table. Now he would say, well, Biden would, wouldn't he? The answer would that, to that would also be no. He has not taken nuclear weapons off the table. He has not endorsed no first use 
and he has not slowed down the new modernization process. So it's a, it's a disease that's easily caught, apparently. On the subject of rationality, Get close to your mouth, please. You state you state that uh, with all of this, the production of it is taking place in all the states in the union. Is there really a difference in rationality between the Democrats and the Republicans on this? Well, you're, you're, uh, it's a great question. Is there a difference between the Democrats and Republicans or uh, on this? No, because uh, uh, the, the, the joke when I was working on these issues in government was that the, the, the B-2 was then a new airplane. And it was because it was stealth bomber. It was amazing. It was going to do all these cool things. And the, the, and this one officer says in front of a group, and it's invulnerable. How is it invulnerable? Because there are contracts on the B-2 in every state of the union. Now, that's the Pentagon you doing its homework and saying, we have to make sure that when we award these contracts, that every senator as a vested interest in jobs that are related to these weapons. And that is where we are. Uh, I can't remember if um, there was talk of this a couple of years ago, but is there any chance that uh, we would need more than just the president to um, give the okay? What are the odds of that in this country? Yeah, the decision-making process is an extremely important question. Uh, because of the short timelines involved, the president, let's say, uh, the, the warning process, you got to find the president. Uh, if he's President George uh, H.W. Uh, Bush, you got to find him on the golf course. Um, and then, you know, you've got to get the decision made, and that's going to take some time. And then you're already out of time. Now, that's why these, uh, these hypotonics are so dangerous. They cut the 30 minutes. Well, there's one more step to this. The, the missile submarines are closer to their targets underwater. And they only give you about 15 minutes to make your decision. And these hypersonics will cut the 15 minutes to about seven minutes. Now, that basically is no time at all. Now, that may be a good thing. That may mean that we will have to have a nuclear detonation in the United States before we make the decision to use our weapons. But uh, that's a very bizarre and strange way, uh, way to define the word good. The decision process, is, yeah, the Congress has so, uh, from time to time proposed that the Congress uh, be involved in the decision making. Now, we all laugh, right? <laughs> OK. Um, they can't decide anything. So, um, and maybe uh, that would be the preference of, uh, of uh, Moscow. But uh, yes, it, it's, it's an extremely valuable, valuable and valid question of what you are really entrusting one person with this destruction of the planet. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, hi. Uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times about the difference between Russia and the United States, Russia having three people must be required uh, to launch something. And that almost came to, uh, to happening. I remember with the submarine during the uh, Cuban, missile, Cuban crisis. missile crisis and, you know, and the one, one uh, commander wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't agree to it. It would have happened if he did agree. Uh, but also, if you read uh, Daniel Ellsberg, the United States doesn't have one football that somebody has to have to launch them because we have a backup plan that if, if you can't make communication, which is the problem that they had with the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, that if you can't communicate to Washington or the president, we must assume that a, you know, a nuclear weapon has taken out the president and therefore, we have generals all around the world who have authority to launch nuclear weapons anytime. That's true. And that's, you know, so we are. And then your question is. Three men required. We've got, I don't know how many, dozens of generals 
will have the launch codes. Well, the certainly the uh, component commanders, the the regional commanders, have this backup authority, and uh, submarine commanders have this authority, uh, and they are they are supposed to be able to if they cannot communicate with their command structure. They are supposed to assume that they the command structure has been wiped out. Now, would they actually do it? We don't know. It will depend on individuals making decisions, uh, which, of course, it, that's true all the way up to the top, right? The president makes a decision. It's the irreversibility of the land-based, silo-based missiles that, that is the worst. The, air, the airplanes carrying bombs are flying through the air. You know how long it takes to fly to Europe. It takes a while to get to the targets. They're not supersonic jets. They're, they're not that fast. So that gives you time to consider the launch of the, of the uh, bombers and the use of the bombers. And in the old days, the bombers used to go up to the Arctic and circle when a, a crisis was underway and wait for the command to go further into the Soviet airspace. Uh, they never did, uh, except in the movies, Dr. Strangelove. Um, but uh, that time is very, very important. The problem with the land-based missiles is they cannot be recalled. We never de de decided to install in them a detonation structure that would detonate the missile if we realized it was a mistake. Because we were fearful that the Russians would figure out how to make that detonator work. And then they, they would destroy our missiles with our own detonators. Uh, so we never installed those. The new missiles will not have any more capability of being destroyed than the existing ones. It's a, uh, uh, I, I'm happy that so many people are here. Uh, I'm happy that a few young people are here because people don't know about this and they don't want to think about it. And uh, people like, me and others have been thinking about it, me for a decade at least, and I, I, I wish I had answers. I wish I had a, a solution. Uh, the only thing that we can do is express our worry to our representatives that this is simply too dangerous. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, that the Pentagon is hyping the fact that, the, that uh, China is building new uh, missile silos. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they have about 300 missiles uh, in silos, and they have a, a publicly available unclassified nuclear strategy. And it says our objective is to be able to destroy 10 American cities. And for that, we need 300 missiles. That's our calculation. And we feel that 10 destruction of 10 American cities is a sufficient deterrent. Sufficiency is what got out of what got out of control. When we went up to sixty thousand warheads, we realized that was insane. We through the start agreements and other agreements, we're now down down to one thousand five hundred and fifty on each side. Those are deployed and ready to be fired right now. And uh, the people who are in charge of them, like the the young uh, Air Force officer I mentioned. Uh, she is. De she was determined that if she got the order, she would turn the key. And I asked her, "Well, do you ever think about what that will do?" And she said, "If if I got the order, they've already attacked us, and I have to retaliate. I have to retaliate." You've talked about heavy nuclear weapons, but. Uh... Could you talk a little bit about tactical weapons on the battlefield, tactical, tactical nuclear weapons? Yes, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, we still have, uh, we, we don't have nearly as many as we used to. Uh, we still have the hundred that I mentioned deployed already in Europe uh, it, with among our main uh, five NATO allies at bases in Europe. And those are simply tripwires, if you will. They are uh, weapons that are there that uh, will say to the European allies that if they suffer a nuclear attack, uh, we will counterattack with nuclear weapons. So they, we are committed under the NATO nuclear command structure 
to do that. Uh, I've lost the train of your question though. Sorry, I repeated. Yeah, can I, yeah, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, we don't have any atomic bombs anymore, so it's hard to figure out uh, how you can make a small enough explosion that would not automatically destroy a huge area. To just give you an example, uh, if Traverse City were hit with an atomic bomb, the entire city area of Traverse City would be flattened and everyone in it would be dead. If we were attacked with a hydrogen bomb, the Lunar Peninsula, the area down to about Big Rapids, a uh, huge area would be wiped out. The, the scale of the hydrogen bomb, which is why it was so fearful and so dangerous, and which, which some physicists resisted the building of it, uh, because it is only a weapon of mass destruction. It is not a tactical weapon. There are those tactical warheads that we have on those bombs in Europe with NATO. There are several hundred others uh, that are in storage and are not deployed anywhere because, uh, as uh, Kissinger once said, yes, we've deployed hundreds of nuclear weapons in Europe, and I, for the life of me, cannot figure out how we would use them. And he was Henry Kissinger. Um, so uh, the threat is there. The use of them never really made any sense because when we designed the original ones back in 1946, we didn't understand how important fallout from a nuclear weapon and radiation from a bomb uh, were. And now we do understand it. And it's difficult to imagine a scenario where you would actually use them and it would be to your advantage to use them. Yeah. So far, we dealt with the intentionality, decisions made by so-called rational actor. But one comes away from reading a book like Command and Control with the unsettling uh, realization that we've been lucky that there haven't been more accidents mm -hmm. by GS-15s who are responsible for, you know, the care and maintenance of certain materials and bombs. Um, luck has an expiration date, an unknown one. So should we be worried about that? Nah, no problem. No. <laughs> uh, let me uh, just uh, mention command and control uh, because it's a very important and interesting uh, example. Uh, it's a book and it's also, I think, been made into a movie. Uh, in Arkansas, there were these liquid fueled missiles in silos. And this is such an a army story. Uh, and even though these guys were Air Force, I, I rang a lot of bells for me as an army officer. These guys are, are sent to the silo, uh, which meant climb there. They got a big backpacks full of equipment with them, two guys. And they go down 10 stories of stairs. And they go across. And they climb 10 stories up to remove a bolt on the warhead. It's an eight megaton, that's eight million tons of TNT warhead sitting on top of this liquid fueled missile in Arkansas. They get to the top of the, they go down, they go across, they go up and they get to the top and they realize they have the wrong wrench. <laughs> okay. So, you know, what do they have two choices? Go back down, across, up, get the right wrench, go up that, or make the one you have in your hand work. So they do that and they begin to unscrew this bolt that's about this big. That's uh, illustrating, uh, you know, something that looks like a, a, a very large uh, TV screen. And of course, it slips out of the wrench and drops straight down. And as if it was meant to happen, it hits a rim at the bottom of the silo, ricochets horizontally and punctures the fuel tank of, which is full of fuel, of this missile. Now, the second thing that's so typical of a military life is if they decide not to tell anybody. <laughs> but the pressure is rising in the, in the silo and they, they 
get in touch, they, 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 what's going on up there? And they figure out that an accident has occurred. So they evacuate. And then they say, well, wait, we can't leave this missile with this warhead on it. So somebody's got to go back in and get the fuel out of the missile. So somebody does go out back into the, the silo. He dies from the fumes. The missile launches itself. Not far. It goes about a quarter of a mile away into a farmer's field. And there's a wonderful photograph of an eight megaton warhead sticking out of a farmer's field. Now, they have used this example to show how perfectly the system worked. <laughs> the warhead did not detonate. You see? It just proves their point. Uh, but it also proves the point that luck is hugely important in all of this. Uh, interpretation, calmness, uh, rationality, as you said, uh, is is necessary, and that is a very thin thread on which to base the survival of the planet. I would argue, but I, you know, here you're looking at somebody who worked on nuclear weapons, nuclear arms control. I didn't build nuclear weapons, but we tried to get rid of them. We tried to control the numbers of them. We tried to figure out how to do that, which is not simple. I was Mr. Warhead counting rules at start which meant I had to figure out a way to agree with my Russian counterparts and my boss, Dr. Ed Ift, uh, to that this is how many warheads are on those missiles, each missile. And I've got to be able to verify that. Remember, Reagan always said, trust, but verify. Well, we we created a way to hide the missiles in a big plastic cover but you could see how many there were but you couldn't see how they were attached which we wanted to hide and so did the soviets and so we figured out warhead counting rules for all the missile types that existed at that time and uh, we were able therefore to say that we have a warhead limit 1550 and you couldn't get there if you couldn't agree on how many warheads there were on each missile. Now, on bombers, it was impossible. So we, we finally settled on the idea that each bomber counts as one warhead, even though they carried about 20. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, the real short times that are available, and they're getting shorter, to make a decision, might not uh, AI make a more rational decision than any human? Uh, yeah, okay, that's an interesting possibility uh, that the, the AI may decide this is so irrational that uh, there's no scenario that makes sense for us to launch our nuclear weapons or use them. But in the movies anyway, the movie versions, uh, no, the, the AI says, wait a minute, we've got a temporary advantage right now. And all we have to do is launch everything right now and they won't be able to respond quickly enough because in other words, a machine is making a numerical calculation that is not hindered by morality or rationality or, but as it's, it's a fair point that, that AI might be smarter than humans. Uh, personally, uh, uh, with the exception of a few humans I can think of, um, I, I don't, by that. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's true. Now, I have to uh, fill in a little bit of my bio here. Uh, when I was, uh, let's see, when I, in 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, and I was 12 years old. I named my cat Sputnik, by the way. Um, but before that, uh, I was five years old, and uh, my brother had me turn on the television early in the morning. Uh, the television was this big. It was a 10 inch Philco in a big cabinet. And he said, watch this. And, and there was a nuclear explosion. And they showed the destruction of the houses that were near the test site. In, in those days, the nuclear explosions were above ground in Nevada. Then we went to the steel pier in Atlantic City, New Jersey, 
and they had the cars, the automobiles that had been exposed to that nuclear blast. As I said, we didn't know much about radiation. And so uh, and then I went to school and right after visiting the, and seeing those destroyed cars, we had a duck and cover drill. And I was terrified. I wet my pants and had to be sent home. So a permanent damage. Jack, first of all, I'd like to say thanks very much for being here. And I can't say it's been enlightening, but I can't say it's been uplifting for sure. Um, one of the things that I think we heard earlier was the rationale uh, question. And I was told by a friend once that you can't rationalize with irrational people. And I think we have to be cognizant of that when we, we go to the polls, and make sure that the people we put in those, those offices have the opportunity to rationalize what, what we're talking about here tonight. But again, thank you very much for your expertise and your, your speech tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I once read, but I can't remember what the estimate was. What What are the best estimates of the minimum number of detonations that would be required to engender a nuclear winter? Uh, I don't I don't know the number, but the nuclear winter, for those who might not be familiar with it, was a big deal uh, 25 years ago when people realized they calculated Carl Sagan was one of them but many scientists calculated uh, that we could uh, lower the temperature to such a degree with all the soot and all the debris in the upper atmosphere that that no crops would grow on the planet that wouldn't kill everything the, the cockroaches would survive uh, but But uh, that became a, a thing, and, and people worried about it, but really didn't do anything about it. And so uh, it's in, it's in, this, in, in a way, it's an unknown number. Why? Because you can detonate a nuclear warhead that, that hits the Earth. It detonates when it hits the ground. Or you can do an air burst, which is what our, most of our weapons are, and they would detonate maybe... Uh, half a mile above the planet, above the surface of the, the target area. And then there are some which would detonate even higher to destroy communications and satellites. Uh, so the, the calculation becomes extremely difficult because then you also have to know how big was the warhead. And so uh, uh, what, we, what, we can, what we are very certain of is that if we have an unrestricted nuclear exchange with all of our available on uh, ready to launch missiles uh, we would trigger this uh on the side this uh this uh, failure of crops first of all we would kill where well, the estimate is that we would kill 50 million russians and they would kill 50 million americans now Herman khan in his book on thilmer nuclear war argued yeah but if you, that's if you do nothing to protect yourself. If you have defenses, if you have fallout shelters, uh, there he argued there is a difference between 50 million dead and 100 million dead. There's 330 million people in the United States. And there is a difference. He was beaten up badly for even suggesting that because it's, it's a nuclear war fighting strategy that you get into that you will escalate in stages as if this will be like a, like a, a, a show on Broadway, you know, one state, act one, act two. Uh, that's, that's an assumption that he was making. And, and he was saying, for example, we won't attack military targets, uh, uh, what are counter value targets. We won't attack cities. We'll only attack military installations first. Well, that's when you had only atomic bombs. If you're going to attack military installations, which ones are you going to attack and where are they? Uh, and then the next step would be, and then we're going to warn you, if you don't react the way we want you to react, we're going to the next level, which is we're going to attack cities. And you still have options. We could evacuate our cities in a crisis. And that makes the cities less valuable. In other words, there are all these bizarre 
scenarios which act, uh, they, they pretend as if this is something that humans can control. When in fact, our emotions are gonna kick in uh, when we see cities blowing up and, and being leveled and, and uh, millions of people being killed. And uh, the emotional side will most likely kick in and say, we're gonna get even with those SOBs. And uh, get even, yeah, but uh, you might get even and you might kill yourself in the process. That's the that's a dilemma. We're in. We're in it. And nobody talks about it. You won't hear anything about it in any debates for presidential debates. Nothing. Considering what's just happened in the Ukraine, does the use of weaponry like cluster bombs escalate the risk of nuclear confrontation? Uh, cluster bombs, I don't think, uh, escalates the nuclear risk. Uh, they are effective weapons to use against um, uh, contact complexes of, of um, what do you call it, uh, trenches. And because uh, they, they distribute themselves in the air and then drop down, and the trenches would be the targets. Uh, they are not gigantic explosions. They're small explosions. Uh, but uh, uh, places where we've used them uh, have suffered for decades, maybe indefinitely afterwards. So the cluster bombs are, Ill, uh, most countries consider them to be illegal, except Russia and the United States. Uh, so I, I wish we were the good guys here, uh, but we aren't always. Yes. Is there something that can be done to put more emphasis on non-proliferation agreements, more pressure to build a uh, Diplomacy more strongly to, to spend more money on diplomacy rather than building. It's more in and non-proliferation. Uh, I was the director at the White House for non-proliferation uh, with three other officers, four of us, and uh, uh, we were trying to keep a lid on the nuclear material that you would need to build a nuclear bomb. Uh, the technology is from the 1940s, and it's all over the internet. Uh, you could figure out now how to build the bomb, uh, but you can't. You don't have the highly enriched uranium or the plutonium. These are the two options uh, that you need to make a bomb, and that's where we have focused our control effort. And so it's it's it includes things like detectors. Uh, in on bridges that, that lead out of ports that that would detect material that's being snuck out by uh, a proliferator a suspect proliferator like north korea or pakistan that who has done has done serious proliferation uh so yeah we could uh put more emphasis on that in 2.1 trillion dollars you'd think there'd be some money for uh, the State Department uh, and uh, negotiations. Uh, like the, the, the Nuclear Risk Reduction Agreement, it wasn't easy, but it was possible. And this was the Soviets, this wasn't Russia. Uh, but they, if you can get in a negotiation where they think they have an interest as much as you do in what you're trying to negotiate, then you can get to an agreement. Uh, even when in the worst of times, and Karen and I have worked in Soviet affairs in the worst of times, uh, when we were not friends, we were, but we were still talking. Uh, right now, we are not talking effectively to Russia or China. And uh, that is a mistake. That is a huge mistake. Uh, there are other players in this. Uh, uh, North Korea, Israel, maybe they deny it. Uh, but they don't actually deny it. They, they neither confirm nor deny. Uh, and uh, some countries have eliminated their nuclear weapons. Argentina and Brazil got into a nuclear arms race and they stopped. They said, this is insane. Why are we doing this? And they stopped and they dismantled all their nuclear structure. Uh, South Africa had a nuclear weapons program. And then when it looked clear that the majority of South Africans were going to run the country rather than the minority whites, they dismantled the nuclear systems. They didn't want to, yeah. 
Ukraine, all right, this is an important point that Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan had Russian Soviet nuclear missiles and other nuclear capable systems on their territory. The United States and Great Britain convinced them to move all of those weapons to Russia. Now, why? Because one, number one, they were always under the command of the strategic rocket forces of Russia, of the Soviet Union, which became Russia's strategic rocket forces. Meaning that the, the three countries, Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, never actually had control of the weapons on their territory. The second reason was that we were worried about proliferation about from these three brand new countries that had no experience in dealing with nuclear weapons on their own. And so we convinced them in exchange for a promise that we would ensure their territorial integrity their territorial integrity was going to be guaranteed by the United States and the United Kingdom. And when Russia invaded in 2014, the Donbass, the Eastern Ukraine and Crimea, we did not defend their territorial integrity. Who's got the mic? Yes, the other microphone. That was actually- Real close to your question. mouth, please. That was actually going to be my question was, it's a horrible thing to say, but doesn't the Ukraine example prove that in the long run, we made the wrong decision and they made the wrong decision to go along with us, that they would have been, they certainly could have seized those weapons and they would have been much, much better off to have them. I mean, it's, it's a horrible thing to say, but isn't that really the conclusion here that once the genie is out of the bottle, you can't put it back? And you Well, I, I don't agree with the premise. I mean, I, it, it might some people may look at it now it's in retrospect and say it was a mistake, but your premise, uh, I, I can't accept that that uh, we would be safer if those weapons were still in Ukraine. Because even if they were, it would be a mere fraction of what Russia has today. And uh, so they wouldn't be nuclear um, peers. They wouldn't be peer nations. They would be an unequal number in Ukraine of one type, just missiles, and a very massive structure of 1,550 warheads in Russia. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to, to replay history. But um, uh, I certainly don't feel confident that Belarus should have nuclear weapons. And Kazakhstan, I don't think they're interested. Uh, I don't think they want they, they've made themselves into a pseudo-democratic country, uh, and they're doing very well economically. They have oil. Uh, so Kazakhstan is kind of not a, not a, a player in this. I, I think uh, in retrospect, you know, we were in good terms with Russia at the time. And uh, so we said, well, Russia can be relied upon. And oh, by the way, we have visited the Russian storage facilities and they were atrocious. So we invested about a billion dollars on securing the nuclear warheads in Russia. Our money went to Russia because we visited some sites that had uh, no fencing, no workable locks, uh, and there were war nuclear warheads there. And we said, that's too dangerous. You know, the country, Soviet Union was falling apart at the time. And so we said, get all the weapons in one place where we can keep track of them. And that's a nuclear risk reduction center. That was one of the roles of the NERC, the nuclear risk reduction center, was that each side would report when a nuclear warhead was moved from point A to point B, when a maintenance team was going to open a silo. All those things um, have now it amounted to 4,000 notifications a week. There's a lot of activities, a lot of weapons. Uh, and uh, uh, but those notifications gave us confidence that we knew what was going on in Russia and that it gave them confidence. And it was uh, built on a structure. There was the Open Skies Agreement, which is out, defunct, uh, which allowed them to say, we want to come to the United States tomorrow. And when we land, we'll tell you where we want to go. And we were doing the same. Uh, the, the, all those carefully crafted structures 
are now falling apart, uh, basically because of the war in Ukraine. And it's not the Ukrainians' fault; it's the Russians. Me, hey, um, thank you, Jack. But uh, I'm just sitting here, and just my mind is just swirling. Um, I, um, I know from experience what cluster bombs do. We've used them in Vietnam, and there's people dying today of our cluster bombs. I know what napalm did, what does that, that did to civilians in Vietnam. They burned and fried. And I know what B-52s, when they drop 500-pound bombs on villages and in North Vietnam, how many innocent people they killed because I think the figure is like 90% of the casualties of war are civilians, just like us. We're sitting here like this and a bomb could drop on us and it's just frightening what's going on here and i would like to know jack if you can help me what can i what can we do to perhaps stop maybe not stop but slow it down instead of just going home and leading our life until something like this could happen what can we do because sometimes i feel my hands are tied they're tied behind my back what am i going to do just I'm just going to walk around and act like nothing's happening when it is happening. And you can hear Jack's a knowledgeable guy. He knows what's going on. And uh, it, it's just, it's frightening for me to hear. Well, uh, that was the objective of tonight's talk. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're at step one. Step two, that to convert your, your fear into action. I, I don't, I, I, as Tim knows, I, I'm not a person who says, get rid of all nuclear weapons because it's unrealistic. We don't know how to do it. But we can control them better. We can change the decision-making processes so that there are more voices. We can require things like saying, we will not launch a nuclear weapon against anybody until a mushroom cloud is, has shown up over one of our cities. Now that is not quite a no first use commitment, but it's a, it's, a, it's a step in that direction. It's to say, we're not gonna start the nuclear war. One, the only country that's made a no first use commitment is China. China said, and it's, it doesn't apply to us or Russia. It says that any, we, China will never use a nuclear weapon against a non-nuclear state. We could say that. Uh, we need to be creative and we need to be vocal. Uh, as I said, all these uh, invulnerable farmers, uh, they're invulnerable because everybody's got a stake. They've got their hand in the money pot. We've got to say, no, no, that's, that's not sufficient. You, as a representative, you have to protect us from the irrationality of this, first of all, this modernization program. Now, you'll hear, oh, wait a minute, the Russians are ahead of us on modernization. Here's just a couple simple numbers. The Russian defense budget last year was $62 billion. The United States defense budget that just is in the Congress right now is $825 billion. The Russians are ahead of us? Wait a minute, I forgot, to, I forgot to mention our allies. We have 32 NATO allies who, when you add their defense spending to our defense spending, we, we the good people, are spending $1.1 trillion a year on defense compared to Russia's $62 billion. Now, who's the aggressor here? Who's Northrop Grumman? Correct. <laughs> Rockwell International. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can start by electing better, smarter, more temperate leaders at all levels. And younger. <laughs> uh, much younger. 
<laughs> yeah, but I, I think you have to be realistic here because, as Jack said, the the it was Obama who who originally passed the modernization plan, right? So, I mean, as we're looking and you're trying to convince people, um, you know, to do something about it, I think you do have to go with the economic argument first and foremost. How can this country afford two point you know three trillion when you look at our debt? currently and then you look at the young people in the room and you say what are we leaving them and you say you know what are we doing when we're saying we can't use these weapons anyway and and what jack was showing in terms of you know every aspect of of whether it's the submarine or or the the new b2 bomber i, I it's it's ridiculous that every single part of it has to be rebuilt I mean, we, we need to take a stand and say, this doesn't make sense. And, and we know that, that our congressional leaders, yes, are all part of that because it's part of the military industrial congressional complex, right? We know. And that's not a criticism against the Democrats or the Republicans. It's the way the system works. And so unless we figure out a way to say we can't afford this madness, and get people out on the streets again. I mean, again, how many of you remember the huge demonstrations from the 70s, right? The huge demonstrations from the 80s. You know, so many millions of people took to the streets that we were forced to take out our Pershing, you know, missiles in, in Europe. And, and yet we just don't, we just don't do that anymore. And, and understandably, I mean, we're so worried about climate change and the world, you know, collapsing that way. I mean, it is a truly discouraging picture. But, but yeah, if I had to lead with convincing people that this is madness, it's on the money front. We, you know, we can't, we can't afford this and, and to do what exactly with it. So, yeah. No, I always agree with Karen. <laughs> Um, but let me let me give you one uh, I gave you one specific thing already, which is no AI in the decision making process. Okay, there's another one: the rebuilding of the silos. The silos have not yet begun to be rebuilt, but they are moving as fast as they can. But the silos are only in four states, so they have a disadvantage. And if we could convince the representatives from the other you know, what is it, 46 states, to say, wait a minute, why don't we not rebuild all the silos and not build the brand new missile and not build the new heads and simply do what they call a life extension? The new systems that they're proposing to build in the silo-based systems would last until 2075, okay, 50 years. Uh, but Almost all the calculations done by the Congressional Research Service, by the uh, you scientists all over the world, by CIPRI in Stockholm, they all say that these silos are not viable beyond the next 10 years because they're just too vulnerable. And you, the only way you could justify them would be a launch on warning policy to say, if there is a warning, we will get the missiles out of the silos on the way to Russia before anything lands in the United States. That's the policy that makes any sense for silo-based missiles. So, you know, let's tell our congressmen, let's tell the Senate, don't modernize the missiles. Let's wait 10 years and see if they have any viability, any and any, do we have any need? for them, and at least that trigger element will be gone. And then we're, we're, we're to the submarines, which are invulnerable. They cannot be detected. They go out, they stop at a particular spot, and they sit there silently waiting for their command. They don't patrol around. They don't move around a lot. They stop. I don't know. I, I met a guy who had spent two years underwater. Uh, yeah, imagine what that does to you. Um, anyway, I think there are other things that could be done that are that are reasonable, uh, but uh, and I wish I could endorse uh, the Veterans for Peace and other great organizations that say we have to eliminate nuclear weapons. I totally agree. 
Now tell me how to do it. Um, I think the key that I heard there was, first of all, education, educating yourself. You're here. That's the biggest step. But then don't go home and just keep it to yourself. Go home and start talking to everybody around you. Don't be afraid to do that. With, this is the only country where we have the freedom to speak up to each other and should have the freedom without fear of retaliation or being sent to prison or being sent anywhere else, we have the right to speak up. So you, and I hear everybody say, well, my voice doesn't count, but you know what? How many people are here? If all of you started going to your township meetings, your government meetings, contacting Senator Bergman, are you on his, I have, emails from every single one of my political people so that I know what they're doing and I let them know what I feel. If all of us went and said we were upset and did the suggestion that these two people said about let's not spend that money, it would make the, it would change everything. But we all have this feeling in us that my voice doesn't count, but it does in this country. Let's stand up and start speaking up and saying, we're not going to do this anymore. I want our country to be here and I want my children to have a country to be proud of. I, I totally agree with you and we can do this. We've done it. You know, the reason that Einstein didn't participate in the building of the A-bomb was because he was considered a radical, because he felt the best thing about the United States of America was that you could speak your mind. And you that is exactly what you were just saying. And, and so you agree with Einstein, or he agrees with you. <laughs> but that's a good company to be in. <laughs> Uh, but he was considered a radical because he had that idea during the war. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but after the war, he kept speaking his mind and they pushed him out. Jim, yeah, you have a microphone there. Okay, well, I think that's going to conclude tonight's um, presentation. I hope you all. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Keep smiling, everybody. Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, uh, let's see.